We are live, you guys. I'm Courtney <laughs> Moore. We've got with us Diane Jago. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Author of A Holy Pursuit. And we've got Courtney Powell, <laughs> our book club coordinator. So glad you guys are here. We're excited about tonight. Um, I'm always trying to make sure we're live. Everybody's good. We're live, right? <laughs> all right you guys welcome to women in work uh book club second live author q a we're super pumped to have diane jago with us we've been in her book a holy pursuit now for the last what eight weeks or so yeah, eight eight weeks. and um, yeah. and just to reiterate the title is a holy pursuit how the gospel frees us to follow and lay down our dreams it's been a great, a great read. We're excited to chat all about it tonight. Um, let's see. Courtney, tell us um, a little bit about the book club, and then we'll go back and kind of give an overall vision and mission of what Women in Work is all about. Yeah, okay, so we launched the book club. This is our second book. Really, we just wanted to come up with a way to help fulfill just the overall mission and vision of Women in Work, which is that we want to lead women towards books that are biblically sound, but we wanted to focus in on areas of women and calling, vocation, theology of work, things like that. So through these types of resources, we are hoping to inspire women just to honor God, um, to image him through the world, um, through their work, and to leverage their potential for his glory. And so far, it's been really encouraging. We take around eight to 10 weeks to go through a book together. And throughout that time, small groups of women, we try to connect women that are, you know, maybe in the same state or region, will meet online and talk about the reading, go through questions together. Um, we'll post the reading schedule and things like things like that, um, just any kind of resources to help spur on that time. And then at the very end, just like tonight, we'll have a Q&A with the author. Um, so stay tuned for the end of this week because we're going to announce the next book tonight at the very end um, of our chat with Diane. So we're really excited about that. So stay tuned. That's right. That's right. And so if you guys are just learning about women in work. Um, maybe you heard about this event tonight from Diane's social media or, you know, a friend shared this on their Facebook page. We just want to welcome all of you here. And just to follow up with what Courtney said, just to let you know why we exist. And um, we really just want to inspire women to step confidently into their God-given calling and view their work as meaningful to the kingdom of God. And so really that means that no matter what you do, that you could be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, you could be on staff at your church, or you could be a stay-at-home mom, whatever, uh, whatever work he's called you to, the calling of your life, we want you to know that it matters, that it matters to what he's doing in the world and his big kingdom grand purposes that you are not forgotten. You're not too small to be used by him and that, that it actually matters to his purposes in the world. And so like Courtney said, the book club is one avenue through which we are hoping to inspire women to step into that. Um, and I don't know, you, Courtney, you mentioned the uh, discussion groups. I, my group, I have been in the same group for the past two books, and it has been such a treasure. We, we had actually planned the book club before the coronavirus um, came about, you guys. And so we had already decided we would probably do a ton of Zoom chats for just the online discussion. And, and my, in my group, I have a woman who... Um, women in my hometown and the town I live in and also in a different state. And so it's just been so much fun to connect with women and hear how all of us are interacting. And it's just been really encouraging to see these women um, step into what he has and talk about the book. And so just to mention our last read, if you are just, you know, discovering women in work and our book club, our first read that we uh, finished up a couple months ago was Worthy, Celebrating the Value of Women. And that was written by Lisa Fitzpatrick and Eric Shoemaker. We totally recommend that book. And we would even say you can head back on our website under the book club um, tab there and find the interview with them. So just to let you guys know, and uh, we're excited, like she said, to tell you guys about our next book. Yeah, so Diane, thank you for being here with us. Before we hop into kind of talking more specifically about the book, we do just kind of want to get to know you a little bit better. I feel like I know you just from reading the book. It feels like we're fast friends, but... For 
everyone who maybe hasn't read the book or maybe is wanting to read the book, but is tuning in anyways. Um, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you living now? Are you married? How many kids do you have? Things like that. Yeah. So my name is Diane. Um, I live in Pensacola, Florida with my husband, Ethan. Um, at the time that I was writing my book, we were in Pennsylvania and then kind of halfway through through it, we ended up moving out to the Pensacola. So Lord willing, we hope to settle here and be here for good. Um, and in the book, I talked about just our military journey. And so we're actually transitioning out of the military life and transitioning into um, him taking on a pastoral position at our local church. Yeah. So um, yeah, so that's exciting. And we have three kids. Um, I have a son, Caden, who's nine a daughter, um, Sky, who's seven, and then a five-year-old whose name is Cora. And um, we run a family business called Deeply Rooted Magazine, which is all about glorifying God in womanhood. And we publish an annual issue. Um, and so the topics of the magazine range from um, theology to recipes and DIYs. And so we put that out once a year and um, I love doing it. That's so cool. Yeah, that magazine's beautiful to you. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. And we were going to put a, we have a link for it um, right there in the Facebook comments. And so you guys on Facebook, um, you know, take note of that and definitely check out our magazine. It's beautiful. And so Diane, in the book, you mentioned how you kind of, as a young child, you didn't you want to be like a cashier? Wasn't that because you like to play store? Or wasn't that kind oh, yeah. of like your first dream of a, of a pursuit? Um, yeah. And then later you said that your English teacher in high school was just very influential in your life. So that kind of, you know, made you want to be an English teacher, right? Yeah. Yeah. But then it was like the Lord, like somehow you really began to love photography. Mm -hmm. That was I, really your passion. And so how does um, Deeply Rooted really connect your magazine? It's just really cool how the Lord like really combined those two the, the photography and really honoring him like can you just kind of talk about that for just a minute how he brought those things together for you yeah it's it's interesting to me how things that we think we want throughout our lives um like I guess even with connecting the cashier thing with it I am like now making the magazine I am selling things I do check check out people's purchases occasionally but even tying in yeah this love for photography um when I was pursuing that I was really convinced that wedding photography was the career that he had for me but later on down the road um I did end up starting this magazine and so it's something where I've been able to use my gifts for photography um I also have a love for writing and um to be able to tie those things together and to be, be able to create this publication and so um what's super cool is that through through it it's something that is beyond what I ever dreamed for myself, but I'm able to also have other people contribute their gifts to, um, to something so much bigger than what my initial dream was. That's so beautiful. I love that. Just bringing women together as you're encouraging women reading it and you're getting to work with these women and still getting to use um, your passion. So I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Are you guys ready to dive into the book? Let's dive in. Okay, and I was let's say dive too, in. Courtney, we might, if there are any women um, watching on Facebook, if they want to submit a question, if we have time at the end, maybe we can get to some of those too. So just put your question in and um, if we have time, maybe we can get to those. Yes. Okay. So tell me, remind me, oh, a Holy Pursuit has not been out for very long. When did it launch officially? Was it this year in March? Yeah, it was this past March. It was the week that everything, at least in our area, was shut down. <laughs> oh, it felt, honestly, it felt oh like man. probably the worst time to launch a book. But what's so interesting to me is that in the book, I talk a lot about God's timing and just his perfect providence and how there's nothing that surprises him, even though it can surprise us. And so I really had to, like in that first week of launching the book, kind of um, just practice what I, what I was preaching essentially in the book, just talking about how, um, God is sovereign. He's in control. And that, um, when unexpected things happen, we can just still use them for his glory and trust that he's leading us, um, the right way. So the book launch felt untimely, but I also recognize that, um, it actually was timely because essentially it's pointing people to the gospel. It's reminding them that whether we press pause on a dream, we lay a dream down, no matter what we're doing with it, that he can be glorified and honored. And so I think it's a message that's timeless. Well, it's also yeah. kind of worked out too, because, well, I say this, if you have kids, it might not have been, but um, the fact that people were home and maybe they had a little more time to actually read. 
So yeah, it was kind of, that kind of worked in your favor, maybe some, I mean, and we yeah. were thankful that you launched because we were looking for an, another book to, to, to read together as a group. So for us, it worked out nicely too. Your, the timing of it all. Yeah. So, it did. so one of the questions I had was, I wanted to know when you wanted, when you were approached about writing this book, I would love to know when you kind of narrowed in on a topic, who you had in mind when you started writing, like what type of woman or what cultural, um, you know, kind of phenomenon, whatever was going on, what made you want to write on this topic in this way? Like, who did you, who did you have in mind? Um, I think it was twofold. Part of it was just, it, it was a resource or it is a resource that I wish I had myself when I was chasing my dreams early on in like my entrepreneurial journey. Um, I've, when I was pursuing wedding photography, I just felt very lost and confused because there was just a lot of messaging at that time. And even still to this day, there's messaging like this, where it's like, if you're not chasing after your heart, if you're not following your dreams, then you might be wasting your time here on earth. Like you might not be living yeah. to your fullest purpose. And so um, having to like navigate through that myself, trying to find my identity in Christ and not in my career, um, I wish there was a guide like that. And so on the other hand, I just kept seeing a lot of messaging on Instagram, on Pinterest, saying a lot of the similar, um, a lot of the same things. And especially being a mom of young kids, um, there's definitely that uh, pressure that I felt where like, okay, if I'm staying at home with my kids and I'm trying to work from home, am I not doing enough? There's just a lot of my friends that I talked to were battling through that. And so um, I think it was something that I wrote for myself, but also just for a lot of women who wanted to hear, let's, let's talk about chasing dreams in a gospel centered way. Do we have to lay them down? Do we have to um, surrender it all and, and just die to all our passions and all our dreams? Or can we do this in a way that is God honoring? What does that look like? And my, um, the way that I, the approach that I take in the book is that there's not a one size fits all answer. And I think that that wasn't really a common message um, that at the time, and that's what the publisher agreed with was that most people are saying like, you do you chase after your dream, hustle, no matter what the cost. Now we're seeing the pendulum swing where a lot of people are burnt out. They're tired. They're tired of hearing those messages. So, so what now? Right. And you kind of, even in, I don't know, I can't remember what chapter, I think it might be chapter two, you kind of talk in detail about some of those specific messages that are put out in culture. Um, like you were talking about, follow your heart. And if you haven't read the book yet, um, she really goes through about what, what are we believing when we hear those messages and how, what is the actual truth of it? So that's pretty neat how you kind of walk through that. Courtney, do you have any follow up with that or? No, I think that's really helpful. I think that what you're saying is true. I mean, we're just totally bombarded with message messages from the culture. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think that there are messages that we're told or that we can feel as women in really conservative Christian culture too. That's kind of the mm -hmm. opposite of what you're saying, where if you yeah. want to pursue a dream, you're kind, or if you want to pursue something, you can be kind of looked down upon. And so I think mm -hmm. like, it's interesting how a lot of the times both extremes can be kind of working against each other, um, which is why what you talk about in the book, just going back to the foundations of the word is really what needs to inform and shape the discussion. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so you've talked quite a bit just um, even now, but in the book, you, you really, you were really like you wanted to be a wedding photographer. It was serious business with you, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh I yeah. Mean, it was, I, it was probably, I would just label it as an obsession. I think because um, when I had chosen to do English education, it was because I was mirroring what my mentor was. Like I wanted to be like her. She had helped me through um, just recognizing that I was like a really apathetic Christian and she helped walk me through, like she discipled me. And so I was like, what is the best way that I can disciple young women? Well, I'll just be a teacher. And what kind of teacher do I want to be? Well, I'm good at math, but that seems boring. Let's try English. And so <laughs> I took my classes and I realized I'm like, this isn't really for me, but I was kind of just selling myself a lie. Like if I get the degree, then maybe somehow I can do photography later on down the road. Um, when I married my husband, then there was just kind of that we, I moved to a different state and there was the freedom to be able to choose like what I wanted to do. And so I'm like, you know what, he's giving me the green light for photography. I'm just going to try it and I'm going to do it. 
And so um, it became something where it was my identity because it's such like a visual, like you're posting your work, people are complimenting it. Um, there's word of mouth. Like it's just one of those careers where you have to showcase what you're doing. And so that was just really fueling this desire for glory for myself, essentially. And so it's not that wedding photography was wrong. It's just that my affections for wedding photography were greater than my affections for God. And so it was out of order and something needed to change. Yeah. And I thought it was interesting. You mentioned that there was one woman in particular, I think it was Jasmine Starr that you were, she had like chosen you to, uh, you know, I forget what you had snapped a pic, you had taken a picture at some event of hers. The crazy uh -huh. thing was I had just discovered her like a month before reading oh, that really? on Instagram. Okay. Yes. And I thought, <laughs> wow. I mean, I was even impressed with her and I, yeah. I don't even do photography, but I was like, <laughs> I totally see why Diane loved her and why it would be such an honor because she has a huge following, Yeah. but it makes sense that, you know, you're getting all this attention and everything. And it really does. It's not only that you're good at it and you have a passion for it, but then you're getting this affirmation. But like you said, it, and it sounded like in the book too, you were just really just knuckle you were just holding it so tightly right mm -hmm. that just the willingness to say okay god this is in your hands on if you want it you know you were just like Ugh, like this right so mm -hmm. tell me um but then you discovered you said in the book that you know you got to follow you, this mentor and you kind of realized wait a minute this is not all it's cracked up to be right mm -hmm. and then it just everything a little bit shifted in your heart like tell us about um, even like kind of what your prayer life was looking like during that time when you were just really going hard after this. Yeah. I think when something like when you're obsessed with something or you're just so taken by something or it's become your identity, all of your decision-making, all of your actions follow, like follow with that dream. And so like I was enslaved to photography and therefore my prayer life was just about photography. And I was constantly thinking about it. Um, I'd stay up way too late researching and learning about it. And when I talked to my husband, it's what I was talking about. It was what was overflowing out of my heart, essentially. I hated writing it in the book because I'm like, this is so embarrassing. It's just a camera. <laughs> like, But the reality is it might not be photography for you, but it could be something else. And so um, my prairie life was definitely just like, Lord, if it's your will, but really it was me wanting my will. Like if I'd say the things that I was supposed to say. And it was almost calculated. Like if I live for God in this way, then he'll bless me with the clients that I want or the yeah. blog features that I want. And so um, that can be really easy to do in, in the Christian life. But when we look throughout scripture, we see that's not how it works. Actually, some of the like most notable people in scripture walk through a lot of suffering. And just because they lived for God didn't mean that life turned out the way that they wanted it to. And so that was a hard lesson to learn, um, just recognizing that photography had become an idol in my life. And when there's an idol in your life and you're a follower of Jesus, you can't serve two masters, something has to go and it had to be photography for me. Wow. Yeah. I think it's um, one of the things that I thought was interesting also about your story is that it seemed like, you know, even as you were photographing and and having a little more opportunity as a, a secondary photographer, but you realized that the career in photography like really wasn't what you thought it was going to be. You know, it wasn't fulfilling you really mm -hmm. um, in the way that you thought it would be. And so it's almost like it's, it read in the book, it read as though your desire really kind of started to shift too, even as you were kind of getting what you, what you thought you wanted. Yeah. It, and I would definitely, yeah, I definitely would agree with that because I was shooting weddings in San Francisco. And even though I was the secondary, like he was giving me opportunities to do just, I don't know, awesome things. And I was starting to get the features and, and God really used that to show me it, it wasn't everything that I wanted. And it's because it couldn't fulfill the way that keeping God number one <laughs> fulfills your life. And so I really believe that as we pursue him and we seek him, he reorders the desires and affections in our hearts. And that's what he was doing for me. He was releasing it. And, um, and I, I was almost dying to it so that he could almost like resurrect it in a different way later down the road, because I still do photography now, but my heart, when I post and um, just the opportunities that I have, it looks so different than how it looked several years ago. Praise God for yeah. that. <laughs> Honestly, probably the most encouraging part of the book for me, which is such a random part, I think. <laughs> but really, 
was when you there's a section I cannot for the life of me remember where it is it's somewhere in the middle but where you kind of go through and you reassure the reader if you are a believer and you have the Holy Spirit you can change like he's going to change you like if you are walking with walking you're in the word you're abiding he's going to change you and so these like sinful thought patterns all these things like he's cap- he's able to do that and it sounds like even in this situation you know he changed your desire he changed your heart um and then you also talk about kind of another disappointment was when you guys thought that was a crazy story when y'all <laughs> were like about to go to germany and then didn't I mean, that is crazy. Well, I think it's great. I don't, I'm not as familiar with, that might be normal. You had this big expectation that was kind of let down photography. And then you guys like were preparing, preparing, preparing to go to Germany. And then right at the last minute that was taken away. So what do you feel like the Lord was teaching you through the experiences of not having your dreams fulfilled? We know that now you have a magazine, you're getting to encompass all these things, but what do you feel like was the most important lesson that God was having what was teaching you through the unfulfilled dreams? I know we talked mm-hmm. about he was crushing idols, but is there anything else that just kind of sticks out to you that God was teaching you during that time? I think the biggest theme that I learned from the Germany assignment falling through was that I am not in control and he is. Yeah. When, um, I mean, we were two weeks out from moving to Germany. Our movers were about to come and uh, my husband was out of town. So this was all on me. And I was so proud and excited. Like I've got this babe. And then he calls me and he's like, we're not going there. Um, we have to, we had to move when our house was sold. It was a very difficult, like I, I seriously had an adult tantrum in my heart. I was just destroyed because there was nothing I could say. There was nothing I could do. The military had the final say. Um, and that was very tough for me to walk through. But what's super cool is that that was like, and I guess anything, any barriers that I had up, I feel like he tore down. I just felt vulnerable, bare, like, like I had no idea what our future would look like. It was very uncertain. Um, Mm -hmm. I had to entrust it to him and I had to say, okay, this is what I know about you. I know that you're in control. I know that your ways are perfect. I know that you're Mm -hmm. a good God. I know that, um, you're working all things for your glory and, um, for my good. And so I had to take that truth and, and accept it in the midst of a situation that I didn't want to accept. And so that really laid the groundwork for any situation here on out. Anytime we would put an offer in for a house and it'd fall through, I was able to like, I was at peace about it. Cause I'm like, that's not where the Lord wants us. Or, um, if my husband was turned down for a different job, even though our, we had already been on Zillow looking for other places to live or whatnot, like I was yeah. able to accept it. And so, um, but yeah, knowing that he's in control and Amy Carmichael says something, she's a missionary, um, from way back when she says, um, in acceptance, lieth peace. And that's been just I, one of the greatest truths to think about is as I accept what the Lord has placed before me, he, there is peace to be found. There's joy to be found and that he works through these situations to teach me something and to make me more like Jesus in the end. Yeah. Diane, that's exactly what I was just sitting here thinking as you were saying all that. I feel like we kind of get honed in on like, okay, this is the goal. This is, you know, we have these things laid out. I want to go to Germany. I want to have whatever the career is or whatever the next thing in our heart really is. And, you know, we, through the lens of our human eyes, it would just be easy to say like, that's gone now and, and not know what to do with it. But then if you pull back the curtain, I mean, just to know the truth that he is using all things to conform us to the image of Christ. And so we know his huge purpose in our life is just that. And so he, I feel like we're looking at circumstances and houses and placements and certain specifics of what we're going to walk through. But then to, to look back and say, wait a minute, God's going to take this opportunity. He's, he's looking for opportunities to conform us to him, you know? And so uh, it's, and then haven't you guys ha- always heard that? Like, if you don't learn it the first time, he's going to keep teaching you that lesson. So, thank God. Like you learn the lesson right there. Like, that as well, I say knock on wood, who knows what the future is, but um, you, you know, thank the Lord. Like you, you learn that. And uh, now you can walk forward. And I just even feel like with uh, the deeply rooted magazine, you, 
it was such a pleasure. It, it feels it, just hearing you talk about it. It just feels like your heart is just so changed. Um, and so it's that hold and all of that. Anyway, he's just using all of that and you're looking more like Christ as you pursue these different things. So anyway, I just kept thinking of that and then you actually said it. So it was uh, kind of funny. That's super cool. <laughs> yeah. So um, one of the things just in the book you talk about is it just sounds like um your perspective of women pursuing dreams, you know, going forward and the things of their heart. Um, it sounds like what you're really getting at is that all of these things should really just be out of the overflow of our relationship with the Lord. And honestly, that kind of language and that thought and sentiment is so what women in work is about. Um, we, we really want women rooted in rooted. This is your word, but, <laughs> actually, but you know, rooted in him so that, all of what we do and carry out is worship, no matter what it yeah. is. And so yeah. I love the chapter, I think it was chapter five in your book, when you really talked about abiding in Christ and how, I mean, I just John 15, really, um, how if we are in him and connected to him, all of these things overflow. So um, anyway, can you just talk to us a minute about that and just how, you know, it's honestly, it's just essential right for us to abide in him and uh, talk to us about how the spirit of God really is the one who empowers us to please him and in, in these endeavors that we're hoping to pursue you know yeah yeah you had when you were just talking to, for the question before this you had mentioned how like our purpose is ultimately you said it in a simple sentence our purpose is to be conformed into the image of Christ and I think so often um when we think about career when we think about all these different th things it's easy to just get lost in our deadlines to get lost in everything that's before us and so it, we're recalibrating our mind as christians to recognize that like we are here for god period and he does use all things and so um that means that in order for us to stay on track with him we have to abide in him we have to spend time with him yeah. uh, we have to be in communion with him and so that mm -hmm. practically looks like bible study it looks like praying it looks like being involved in church community um it looks like just discipleship and um, it, it's so important for us to do that because we have to stay within that mindset so that we're not affected by the people telling us that we're what we're doing isn't enough or we need to be doing more or, or whatnot. And so, um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to re regain my thought of what the actual question was. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Just about the importance of abiding in him and how really it's his spirit Oh yeah. It empowers us and really enables us to do it, you know? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So in order for us to do that, we don't do that in our own strength. I've tried it and it doesn't work because you either fall into legalism or you just get burnt out and you're tired and you quit and you say you can't do it. And so one example that I give in the book is talking about the fruits of the spirit and how um, I, I was talking to my kids about how um, an apple comes from an apple tree or an orange comes from an orange tree. Well, fruits a tree is known by its fruit. And so in order for us to bear fruit, we have to be connected to the vine, which is Jesus. And so um, I just think that as we are walking out in our dreams and our, our callings to recognize that we have the Holy Spirit living within us, that he empowers us to bear fruit as we're doing it so that we can be a light, so that we can walk worthy of our calling and do all that he's called us to do. Um, it just requires dependence upon him. And that's something that um, it doesn't always feel pleasant because it, it's basically highlighting our weakness and this recognition that apart from him, we can do nothing and that we need him every step of the way. Um, and yet it's so freeing when we discover that because we don't have to carry that burden and we recognize we don't have to be perfect um, because he's making us perfect and he already is a perfect one for us. So I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. 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 What were you going to say something, Courtney? I don't want to. Yeah, no, I was just going to say it makes a lot of sense. And I think I love the example of the, I mean, it's such a simple concept, you know, that, that an apple tree bears apples and, you know, I mean, it really is, it's a simple con concept, but staying connected to the vine, we cannot have an expectation that we're going to bear good fruit if we're disconnected from the vine. I mean, that's just really what it's about. Um, the abiding element of our walk with the Lord is, it's, it's just the most important thing, honestly. Um, so before well, you jump ahead, Courtney, oh, I was sorry, just thinking, what, what would you guys say to women who know this truth? You know, they, they know this truth that, that they have to stay connected to him, but let's say they find themselves in a season where they've said yes to too many things. They're really overloaded. 
Um, I mean, there has to be a point where, you know, we're not always because we're human and we're sinful. Um, we're not always abiding perfectly. We're not remaining perfectly in him. So I feel like there has to be a point where sometimes you're just, you have to recalibrate and say, wait a minute. Um, I got to get back on track with the Lord, you know? And so, yeah, I don't know. Are there any specific things y'all can, or Diane, that you might, how you might encourage women to, I guess, honestly, it's just toward repentance, right? I mean, just getting, getting back to fellowship with him so that you are empowered yeah. and you're not walking in your own strength, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes that could like the, the thought of man, I've been so out of sync with God that can be what holds us back from communing with him. And so, um, sorry, my power cord is not working right now. <laughs> oh, good. oh, there we go. Thank you. Babe. Um, and so that can be like a hindrance to us jumping like that can be the biggest ex excuse for us not jumping into time with God and so we just have to be able to lay that down and recognize God knows us he knows that we're human he knows that we yeah. are still living in our flesh and that it happens and so if we can come to him in that kind of humility and just ask him and that's why I love Psalm 119 because it's one of those um psalms that is just filled with the the psalmist plea like give me like give me understanding help me yeah. if you look throughout it there's so many asking um words in there because he recognizes that again apart from god he can't do it and so um having the humility of going before god and just saying listen i i haven't been in my bible a lot lately please give me understanding ask, ask the holy spirit to help illuminate the passage to you um and just i don't know having a posture of humility and recognizing that you don't have to come to god all put together that's not what he's expecting or asking from you and then also i think um just having friends that help hold you accountable, um, being a part of church who just to have that fellowship because we're called not to neglect meeting with one another. We need to stir each other up. Um, we need to be iron sharpens iron. And so being involved in church community and having people that are pouring into us is another way to just stir our affections for God and, um, help us get back on the right track. Um, those are like two things that come to mind right now. And I also think just what you said about like sometimes just that hindrance of, oh, no, I'm not where I should have been all this time. And it, it kind of is a hindrance to come to him. I feel like there there's so much peace on the other side of that. Like if you can just tell yourself, wait a minute, once I come clean, once I confess and just come clean before him, like there, mm -hmm. there's no condemnation in him. Yeah. There's no condemnation in Christ that he is going to shower me with peace and forgiveness and love. And so if yeah. we can tell ourselves like, okay, let me get over that hurdle of, um, I haven't been where I need to be, but I know there's peace on the other side. I think that would help too. Just yeah. the faith to believe that. That's great. Um, okay. So you talk about in the book, I thought this was really interesting. You asked for your social media followers to identify the top reason that they don't move forward with pursuing their dreams. And the answer is fear of failure, which I can totally resonate with. I have a deep fear of failure. I would do not do things that I think I could fail at usually. <laughs> it's a real problem. And so I resonate with all of these, you know, all of these women that said that. So what encouragement would you give women that that's what's holding them back? Maybe all these other things are lining up and whatever, but what's holding them back is their own fear that they're going to fail. What encouragement would you give them to just to go for it? Um, just to kind of pursue that goal and, and know that they can do that confidently because there's the freedom that we have in Christ to do those things. What would you tell like women that are, that are struggling with that? Yeah. I, I would ask them, how would you define failure? First of all, like success and failure, what is success to you? And what is failure? Oftentimes um, it's defined by how the world defines it, which is still ever changing, but oftentimes it's like how much money you're making or how, how big your following is. Like that's, if it's big, yeah. if it's over a certain number, it's successful. If it's, um, if your follower account isn't growing, you know, you're failing. And so when we look at those definitions, they're not truly biblical definitions. In the book, I talk about how ultimately success to the Christian is to stand before God and to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. That is true yeah. success. Um, and when we realign our thinking in that way, it really frees us up to change how we see um, success and failure in this lifetime, how we step out into things. Um, I think another thing is like, when I think of 
fear of failure. Like, why am I scared of potentially failing? So if failing, it looks like, I don't know, starting a business or even a crowdfunding campaign. That's what I did for the magazine. If I were to start this crowdfunding campaign and I didn't raise enough money to make the first issue of the magazine, why would I be scared about failing? Is it because I am embarrassed that I put myself out there and no one liked my, my product? Um, yeah. Is it because uh, I'm placing my hope in the success of this magazine? Like there's just kind of asking yourself and really getting to the heart of where this fear is coming from can be helpful. Um, but then ultimately trusting that if we believe that God um, is in control, I, I keep bringing that up, but if we believe that he's in control and that um, he's big and powerful and all things are possible with him, there is the, on the other side, this possibility of he could make the crowdfunding campaign happen. He could, um, it could be t successful, you know, by, def by worldly definition. But the reality is that whether we fail or succeed, God is still glorified and he's still using that failure or that success to conform you into the image of Christ. And he's still going to use that story for you to be able to help someone else who might be in the same situation. And so when we release, um, you know, the worldly definition of failure and success, um, and we just trust in the Lord and we walk forward in, in faith, knowing that God is still good at the end of whatever outcome happens, then, um, then I don't know, it's freeing. <laughs> it sounds simple, but it's, it's really true. And a lot of it is just a mental barrier that we have to be able to get past. And we have to be able to go back to the truths about who God is and to rest in that um, and not be so introspective looking at ourselves the whole time. Oh, right. Man, that is a good word. <laughs> I think like well, the whole time you were talking, I was thinking, I'm, I'm married to someone that's in ministry. And I was just thinking, I was watching a video of a, an interview with a man that was um, a pastor of like a real tiny rural church. And he was just talking about how there are, there are small, you know, rural churches all over America and they might not be growing leaps and bounds and they might not be looking this certain way, you know, ministry, so much of ministry is just kind of digging your, your heel, you know, just like, staying steady and mm -hmm. one of the things he said which it's it was just kind of like what you were saying was that you know success is faithfulness ultimately you know like the measure of our success is just faithfulness we just mm -hmm. we we walk in obedience we stay faithful to what God has called us to and that's ultimately that's all that it is that's all that it is um I think I have never until you were just talking I had never really thought to a, a thought about how that applies in all, you know, in outside of just ministry too, you know, it just applies mm -hmm. in all of, in the workplace too. It's just, we do, we work diligently, we're faithful, obedient to what he's called us to. And that's, that's success ultimately. That was, that was really encouraging. Thanks for answering that. Yeah. Well, and the other thing I was thinking when you were talking, I mean, as soon as you said, well done, good and faithful servant, I mean that, in fact, if you go back and look at that, the parable of the talents, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when Jesus says, okay, you, you guys know the parable, but that is where that statement comes in. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a little, so I'll give you more. It's through these, these, um, workers being faithful to either, you know, invest wisely and they produce all this other fruit, you know? So I just think that's so fitting for just, that's our main goal. And the fact that it comes after that parable, which to me is just all <laughs> about like serving the Lord and, with your fruit and your life, you know, and the gifts he's given you. But the other thing I was thinking about a motivator for uh, overcoming the fear of failure is, and you, you talked about this a little bit in the book too, is um, the first um, and second greatest commandments. First, love the Lord, your God, but the second one, love your neighbor. I mean, if God is calling you to serve in a way, and I mean, even through secular work, right? I mean, if you're stepping into a position that actually serves other people's needs, um, and I don't, you know what I mean? I don't mean just by ministry. I mean, just, you know, you're selling them a shirt and they need a shirt. I mean, anything as serving a need. I think if you're, if your heart is to love him through it and to serve others, um, that's a, that's a help to me to get over my fear. Because again, it's not about me. I'm taking my eyes off of me and I'm putting it on the Lord and others. And he might just be pleased to honor that. You know, he might just be pleased to give me the go ahead on that. So anyway, I love, yeah. I love those thoughts, ladies. I also had another thought I just, and it kind of is going off of what you were saying, but how sometimes we're so focused on like 
there's nothing wrong with having goals, obviously, but like we're so focused on what's ahead that we're not seeing the opportunities that we have now. And so if we're thinking about our follower account or we're thinking about, you know, this position or whatever it may be, um, like how are you using the gifts, the passions, the desires that God has given to you with the influence that he's chosen to allot you with right now? One, one example that I think of is my husband. When he was um, teaching a Sunday school class, he started with, it was me in the class and one other person who faithfully came. And I remember him like kind of the first day being like, should I keep teaching this class? There's only one person that's coming. And then the Lord convicted him and he was like, I, if I can be faithful with one, like that's all that matters. If this can help one person, what's super cool is this per it was a hermeneutics class, she learned how to study the word. She went and taught a high school class and now she's teaching Bible there. And she said it, it ended up multiplying. But on the other hand, my husband's ministry has continued to grow a little by little by little. And that's the way that God has chosen to do it. He might not do that in all instances, but I've seen yeah. the faithfulness of him with little. I, what's that saying? Like to, uh, I can't think of it. I'm so bad with things. I shouldn't even try. But basically, if you're faithful with little, you can be faithful with a lot. And so yeah. what is it that he's called you to right now? How can you use those gifts? And let's not be so focused on the future or what's ahead um, that we're missing what's before us. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is so true. Okay. Well, going back to your story with beginning uh, your magazine, Deeply Rooted Magazine, <clears throat> I think it's so cool how you guys, I mean, you talk about trusting the Lord and like trusting that he's in control of all these. There was a point in there. Okay. Remind us, Diane, did you start out the magazine with four issues a year and then drop to two? Remind us how it, how the sequence went. Yeah, we started the first two years were four issues. And then the next two years were two issues. And then after that, we moved to one issue. <laughs> right. Yeah. I just thought that was so interesting because it's, it's, it's kind of the opposite of what the world would tell you to do, how to grow a business. But yeah. you guys really were just faithful to look at, okay, here's the season of life. I mean, I can't remember, but was it like, was it like you, you were having another baby? I can't remember. There was like a homeschool thing you guys were starting out and you just knew like, this isn't going to work having all these issues, right? Yeah. Basically because we've like, my husband's career has moved us around his job has constantly changed. So his hours have constantly changed his deployments. And so I would work whenever, like we, we had lots, we had started with one kid and now we have three. So that changed too. But like, as he would work or work or get deployed, that's when I'd find pockets of time. So when he'd come home, <laughs> we had to like refigure out our schedule and learn how to adjust to that. So um, we'd go through seasons where I'm like, okay, this is just not working. This isn't working for our family. And I just, I knew that first I wanted to be a stay at home mom. And this was an overflow of the other callings this magazine was. And so I felt burnt out and I felt tired. And I'm like, I can't keep doing all, I can't wear all the hats. What should I do? And I just sense that the Lord was leading us to scale back issues. And um, obviously, whenever I make a decision like that, I don't take it lightly. I'm praying about it and seeking counsel. Um, I'm just talking to a lot of different people, but um, we've had such a piece about doing this kind of backwards way of running a magazine. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so an annual issue works well for us. Uh, yeah. I, just, I think that is, it's, I don't, it just encouraged me, I think, to just remind me just how important our families are. If you're a wife and a mom to, you can't allow these other things to not only steal your, your heart, but your time, your time as well. And I mean, like you were just saying, I mean, if you, we're just finite people and we can't, we can't juggle all the plates can't stay in the air at all times. And so there's has to come a point where you're like, wow, I just can't, but your business, I mean, it's continued to grow and you guys have a huge readership. So Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally him. <laughs> yeah, I think that is one of the things, even as I was reading the book, that I was just encouraged and reminded of is that, I, I mean, everything is just, it flows in seasons and different seasons afford different capacities and, you know, and so it's just comforting to know that you might make a decision like you guys did where you did four a year and then it changes. It doesn't mean you were wrong to do four a year. It doesn't mean, you know, it's just, it changes. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. we just have to be sensitive to the change and if something does need to change and things like that. So I, I find that really encouraging because sometimes decisions can be overwhelming for me because I think if I make this decision, then mm -hmm. that's it. And that's not how it works. There's yeah. just a lot of freedom. Like 
actually, if it's not working, we can change our minds, <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> we can change it True. up, so yeah, I thought that was really, I think that's really good, and I love that the magazine is still doing well, it's, it is really beautiful, again, we have a link to it in our comments, um, but please check it out, it, it is, it's a beautiful magazine, it's really well done, it's big too, I mean, it's, yeah, I, even the thought of you doing four of those a year, that's a lot, that, that would have been a lot. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm not sure what time it is, but as we're starting to kind of wrap up our time together, I wanted to know what is one last piece of advice that you want women to walk away with tonight about pursuing their dreams and goals? Like if you just had a nugget or like just one little piece of wisdom, that you, you want to make sure that everybody knows and everyone walks away with, what would it be? I think it would just be... Um to seek the Lord in all things. A lot of times there's just a lot of noise, um, whether it be online or family opinions or whatnot, we can get so lost in our minds of like, I don't know what, what I should do. Should I press pause on a dream? Should I move forward? Like, what should I do? We can really get into our own heads. And so, um, even though like it can be easy to turn to resources to try and find answers or to you just want to hear a voice come from the sky kind of a thing yeah. as you spend time with the Lord, like truly be still before him, open your Bible. And it's, it's not going to say like, Diane, I want you to do X, Y, and Z, but God's word is <laughs> living and it's active and it's powerful. And he speaks to us through it. And, um, as we're praying, he helps us. It, it sharpens our mind. It gives us wisdom. It helps us to discern things. And, um, as we plan our course, he directs our steps. And so I, I can guarantee that you will come out of your quiet time, consistent abiding in him with a more confidence in the next step that you're supposed to take. So yeah, I love yeah. that. That's beautiful. See, I just want to say thank you guys so much for the opportunity to be on here. I love your mission. I love that. Like, there's just not a lot of resources for women and, and work. It's a topic that like a lot of women want to talk about and want to hear about. So this is really special that you guys are doing this. I'm so grateful for it. Um, and I am really grateful just that you guys took the time to read my book too. So thank you. Thank you, Diane. That's so sweet. Thank you. Um, well, thank you again for writing the book, for giving yes. material to mull over and pray through and examine our own lives and our own hearts. And so we're grateful for you right now. We're thankful for you coming on. Thanks for taking an evening out from your family. And guys, if you are listening and you hopped on and for some reason you just discovered we have, we're reading um, A Holy Pursuit, jump on. Um, we have the link right there in the comments. Jump on, buy her book. Um, you'll be glad you did and grab the deeply rooted magazine while you're there. We, we got that link as well. All right, you guys, now is the time you've all been waiting for. <laughs> we are going to announce our next book club book. And let me preface, we are going to be taking a tiny little break, right, Courtney? Cause we've been, we've been, yes, we are we're gonna take a little break for August and we're going to start this uh, probably beginning of September. So just keep that in mind. All right, Courtney, share with us. I'm excited. Okay, so the next book we're going to be doing is called Made for More, An Invitation to Live in God's Image. It's by Hannah Anderson, and I'm really pumped about it. So she's also, she's written a couple different things. Um, she has a book on discernment, and she has a book called Humble Roots. And all of her books are really good, so you can check any of them out. But we're going to link specifically to this one. Um, it's, it's a book that has a lot to do with identity as, as women. It's, um, but there, I don't know, I don't want to give it away, but just the way that she talks about our womanhood and connects it to our personhood in Genesis three, just all the different, or in Genesis one and two and three, and throughout, throughout all of scripture, it's so helpful. And then she has a, a specific section in there on work and how knowing who we are in Christ as image bearers. How it, how it affects our work. And so I'm really excited about it. Um, it's going to be great. So like Courtney said, we're not going to start right away. We're going to take a break. We all need a break, right? We all need a break. So we're going to hopefully launch beginning of September. And then Hannah has agreed. She's going to do a Q&A with us as well at the very end. So I'm really excited. So be sure to buy a copy of that before we get started. 
Right. And I mean, I love it. I love that it's going to be about um, our identity, who we are as image bearers. And just like we mentioned, the whole purpose of the Women in Work Book Club has to do with our mission, vision, and values. And if you go on our website, on our about page, our first value is the fact that women are image bearers, um, that we're made in the image of God, we're capable of expressing his character through our work as we steward our gifts, our abilities, our intellect, our passion and potential all um, for his glory. And so this is just going to be a really great read. Diane, join us. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I'm I've heard great things about her books. I haven't read it, but her humble roots is on my stack. So <laughs> it's really good. That's a good one to start with. <laughs> the other thing is if you just are listening and you're like, I'm in, I know I'm in, I'm joining this book club. Um, and you, you're just ready to go. We have a form. We would love for you to fill out. It should be heading into the comments right now. Just let us know that you want to be a part of this. And also it's like a four or five questions on the form. You can let us know if you want to join and if you would like to be um, put in a discussion group. And I want to tell you guys, the discussion groups are where it's at because just like we've talked about, it's just having this community of women um, thinking along the same truths at the same time together, even through the internet, y'all can be really encouraging. And so I want to encourage yeah. you to say yes to the discussion group. And there's also a place in there you can offer to be um, a leader of the group. And so um, for each of our books, thankfully, our authors have um, given us discussion guides. And so it's not like you have to come up with the questions yourself. We just will, we will provide that for you, but you just decide I'm going to be the ones that ask the questions and lead the discussion. So we're super excited. All right. We have one last announcement. Another initiative, Diane, that you might not know we've got going on right now is what we've called the Women in Work Summer Series. And so each um, month in June, July, and also in August, we have been interviewing a woman um, talking about her work. And so guys, head to our website to see our interviews with Whitney Caps. She's a Bible teacher, and she just gave some, oh my goodness, some life-giving encouragement in June. Last month, we just met with Michelle Rigby Assad, who was... Um, a secret agent, you guys, in the CIA, not making that up. She's a Christian, her view of work, the whole thing. It was fascinating, Diane. Um, and so I want to tell you guys, put a reminder on your phone. It is August 18th. Um, I think it's the 18th. It's a Tuesday night, 7.30 p.m. Central, the same thing we've been doing. It is with Donna Gaines. Donna Gaines is um, several things. She is a wife and a mom. She is a pastor's wife out of Memphis, Tennessee, um, she's written Bible studies and books. Uh, she also, I think, right, Courtney, she, is she a former teacher as well? I think, she I think that's right. And the, the other thing is that she started a nonprofit, and this is what I'm really interested to talk to her about. It's called Arise to Read. Um, and it, she's using her life as an educator basically to um, connect mentors with third grade children who just need a boost in reading, right? In the public school system. And so, and through that, she's forming Bible studies um, to just love on these children after school. So it's gonna, it's gonna be a great time, you guys. So that's August 18th, Tuesday. So mark your calendar for that. And again, you can go on our website and look under events and find the videos to the past months, as well as um, info about Donna Gaines coming up. So again, thank you, Diane, for being here. This has just been um, really encouraging. It's been fun. Thank you so much for having me. All right, Courtney, any last words before we log off? No. Nope. <laughs> All right. God bless you guys. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Bye.